Paris. But that's the Pride de la. And that's a, 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 a pop culture reference I'm making here that dates me. So the Pravda was the official newspaper uh, in the Soviet Union, where uh, uh, Soviets and Russians in general knew what was printed there may not always be the reality on the ground. And this reality of the ground, again, is a lot better than what it seems. I'm going to talk briefly about this current recruiting season and then what I think is going to happen a year from now. Um, so many good news have actually occurred. The enrollment of, uh, enrollment of undergraduate students and therefore uh, tuition revenues in many universities have stayed surprisingly rather steady. A few hundred people um, and undergrads have delayed enrollment, but by and large, faced by the prospect of even worse alternatives, staying home with their parents, for instance, uh, many uh, elected to actually even if the course is well aligned, to uh, re-enroll. And therefore, revenues have remained mostly steady um, as opposed to what was forecasted ahead of time. Uh, schools have also learned to operate extremely safely. I'm a VP for research at Hopkins. I oversee, I oversaw the return to research to university and have been over time uh, allowing for laboratories and other research um, uh, uh, facilities to increase density over time. Um, that means, and in practice, extremely few cases of on-campus uh, um, contamination uh, and infection. Uh, I've surveyed most universities, and I think there's a paper to be written here, where we've learned how to work extremely safely. That bodes well for uh, a job market. Um, enrollments for master's program have also dramatically increased. That happens always in times of crisis. We all forgot that. That actually, and especially for sought after fields like AI, uh, public health, biotech, uh, enrollments have dram dramatically increased. That means uh, what was forecasted as being uh, really a loss over time is actually a, 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 a profit in the profit uh, column, if you will. Um, clinical revenues have also been now back to normal by and large. Um, elective surgeries have resumed, uh, clinical trials have resumed as well. So overall, the financial picture has dramatically uh, improved. Let me illustrate with Johns Hopkins. We're forecasting minus 75 million loss for FY20, which finished in end of June. We ended up with actually a profit of 50 million. We were also anticipating a $350 million loss for the current fiscal year, we already just at 75 million. Most universities have seen dramatically reassessment and much more positive reassessment of the financials. Again, that bodes well for the job market. And the financial hurt um, has been a lot less than predicted. It depends also if you are in a private or public schools. Um, and uh, uh, business schools have been more affected than engineering schools, for instance. Um, it's have been very local as well. New York City-based schools have seen a lot more financial hurt than, say, in Baltimore or Los Angeles. Um, but by and large, for the current market, there's a lot of openings. And my survey showed that about 50% of universities are actually hiring. There's a... Um, there's, uh, uh, sorry, there's um, uh, official hiring phrases, but most universities have reopened the door for recruitment um, to fit local, uh, sorry, um, uh, priorities of strategic importance to the universities. That's a code word for giving some flexibility for departments. And I know for a fact, Departments of chemical engineering, biomedical engineering, biophysics, which is more closer to my area, are actually hiring. Again, Hopkins comes to mind. Well, officially, there's a hiring freeze, but there's tens of openings in clinical department, preclinical department, basic science department, and even social sciences. Okay? So that's what's mostly out of your control. So in a way, to some extent, you shouldn't worry about it. You can't help it. You'll worry about it. But what I'd like to switch to is really some very practical advice of what you can do right now to really improve your uh, positioning 
when comes time to actually apply, or if you're applying to change your posture and really update your CV and let those uh, search committees know where you stand right now. First of all, if you thought publishing that big paper in Cell Nature Science or equivalent, right, is the, your key to uh, landing a faculty position, mostly you're mistaken. Okay? And those departments that I think uh, for, for whom, uh, for which rather, uh, this matters, maybe shouldn't be the department you should apply for. I, my first piece of very practical advice is to sure get published a big paper out of your postdoc, out of your PhD, but really finish those smaller projects you set aside and write them up. Um, uh, let me take the example of um, of review articles that could add to your CV, right? If you've written an, an expansive review over the, um, uh, uh, of the literature for your PhD dissertation, or you've written an expansive introduction uh, of a recent paper, paper that you've uh, uh, published, you can you know, force yourself um, to write up and invite yourself to a, a bunch of journals which are hungry for over, uh, oversight reviews of the literature. Um, for instance, um, journals like Nature Reviews, Annual Reviews, Current Opinion, Trends In, etc. In my lab, during the last three months, we've literally invited ourselves um, to Nature Review and Annual Review uh, with subject that, for which we're not really expert in immunology and immuno-oncology, uh, which are relatively new for, for research. So what do I mean by inviting yourself? I mean, write a mini proposal with night nice figures. That's what we did. Uh, so I used to dismiss reviews uh, as really CV fillers. I've completely changed my mind about it. Uh, on their own, of course, they're not sufficient to land you a job, but they can complement your current CV. And also writing a review provide you with either some sort of a way to capstone a series of papers you may have written to really demonstrate ownership of the field you've not normally launched, or to introduce yourself to a new subject of research, which is what we did here in immunology. All right, uh, a second piece of advice is if in the course of your PhD or your postdoc, you developed a new tool as part of a larger project, which is now published, I say write it up as a protocol. Uh, many journals, nature protocols come to mind, um, publish such protocols. Indeed, having published a paper uh, making use of um, this protocol already established that it matters and, it ma and it's important. So it's not because you may have given some even a lot of details in your publication. A protocol is a slightly different beast and it adds to your resume, of course. But um, here's what we do when we have developed a new technique. In my lab, when we decide to write such a nature protocol, we block six uninterrupted weeks and just write it up. Uh, it's a lot of work, but typically does not involve new experiment. So such a protocol signals to hiring committees that you are eager to share detailed info uh, to the larger community. And of course, it adds, as I said, a, a paper to your CV. Right? The second piece of advice is about preprints, okay? If you're not quite finished with your big postdoc or PhD uh, paper, but uh, within one or two months before submission of that manuscript, my recommendation is to post this um, mostly finished, not quite polished paper uh, onto one of those new preprint uh, depositories. BioArchive, Archive, MetaArchive come to mind. Uh, you can list it in your CV and a fellowship application these days, NIH allows for such uh, a, a statement that you've posted this, uh, this um, uh, preprint, and it counts a lot, lot more than a paper you would list under um, in preparation category in your CV. Um, plus, if you think you could get scooped, you're forgetting that it took you a, a lot of time to design, run, and analyze the, those experiments. So there are very few exceptions to this rule, including your direct knowledge that there's another group indeed doing exactly what you're doing, which never really in practice happens. And even in this case, my recommendation is actually to reach out to that group and propose 
cost submission to uh, the uh, big journals you want to publish in. We've recently done the exact that exact thing where we had a big story in mechanobiology, learned that a group at Penn was doing the same thing, which taught to a big name journal and indeed raised the profile of our story and their story since two groups were doing the same thing, not the same thing really, at the same time. So take advantage of these preprint depositories to uh, add to your, your CV and your ability to, to show actual productivity. Um, should you be involved in COVID research? Uh, maybe, maybe not. If um, you can contribute to COVID research, say as part of a larger group at your university, absolutely do it. You will get published, of course, much faster as many journals are now eager to publish COVID stories. Um, and of course, more importantly, you will contribute to the worldwide effort to develop um, you know, treatments, uh, vaccines, understanding of the disease, and on and on. Note, however, as said, as part of a larger group. If your project take would monopolize entirely your, your work, and now you can resume your uh, uh, more conventional work, you can you in your lab, I would make this a second priority, as hiring committees will pay a lot more attention to those regular papers you publish that are not COVID stories. My fourth um, piece of very practical advice is to make an ensure sharing with your lab members uh, the, the tools and the ins and outs of how to use the tools you may have developed in your PhD or postdoc, right? Um, with agreement with advisors, loop that uh, advisor in, talk about co-authorship. You've developed a piece of software, you've developed a new high throughput self phenotyping uh, uh, platform. If someone else is using it, make sure Credit will be also partly shared with you. You may not be the main author, but it's going to add again and demonstrate to hiring committees you are the sharing type. You believe in team science, which is more and more valued. Okay. Um, if you can't be full time in your lab, right? If you are uh, in between projects, right? You have to wait another year uh, for the job markets to uh, uh, open up more. Learn new techniques. Um, uh, if you develop a new technique, I talked about this, right? Uh, share it with others. But um, I like to point to my own experience where I was in, labor in, a, in laboratory uh, during my PhD. Um, uh, that was not known for the work I ended up doing, which was theory and, and light scattering uh, work. They were known for work in rheology and, and optical rheology. In the last two months of my PhD, I learned about those techniques, and indeed, that's why I ended up doing more of, as I set it off, my tenure track position at Hopkins. Okay. So a fifth piece of advice, rather six, is uh, to expand your network at your own university. Right? Um, I'd like to point to a survey from Nature that showed that one of the things that have really dramatically changed is the accessibility of advisors to the students. Um, I think the format we're using today, WebEx, Zoom, have made it so a lot harder and um, more structured and less free-flowing flow uh, style of interaction between student and postdoc and the advisor. That means less dedication and less kind of one-off conversations leading to just great advice that that advisor may forget when you know meeting with them once a week or once every two weeks for an hour. So expand, therefore, your networks with co-advisors, with additional faculty in your department, having those conversations, which can lead to multiplication of champ champions, really rooting for your success uh, in your search for faculty positions. Okay. Um, talk to alumni in the group, right? Um, the one, um, thing I ask from every student and postdoc who graduates from my group is to open the door for the next student for the next postdoc. If they're in government, to just ensure my students who's interested in government, say, to work at NIH, to work at the FDA, to land an interview. Uh, or for academic positions, to land that interview, to be in the conversations. If you then, given that chance, thanks to the connections you have, 
of alums in the groups, you can know uh, it's on your own. It's for you to, 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 to get that position. Um, so get out there, uh, see who are these alums, start conversations. More fun than not will be very ha happy to hear news about the group and to help you out as the broad alums of, of, of that group. Okay, the, the next piece of practical advice really is about taking advantage of databases that my office at Hopkins has launched about postdoc applications, okay? So um, if you are starting a postdoc or in the middle of one, you may think that if you've tried out the usual usuals, like NIH, F awards, and the like, you're out of luck, you are finished. If you're not a citizen or green card holder, even more so, because you think most postdoctoral positions are really open only to American citizens and residents. That is utterly untrue. We found hundreds of postdoctoral fellowships in many different fields. There's many foundations that you may have never heard of that would be very interested in giving you a postdoctoral fellowship. Not only does it help financially your current advisor, but it helps you in providing you with freedom. Right? If that advisor is really may not up to snuff, you may switch more easily to another group, to a second postdoc, for instance, um, having that postdoctoral fellowships. I don't know if we have the time um, to, to, to show this, and I don't know if you can still see my presentation, but I'd like to quickly show you, I've cut it and pasted it, uh, the web uh, 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 address of this resource that we have. You click on this, you download the Excel file, and indeed, in no time, here he is, you have your postdoctoral uh, opportunities. You're going to see, as I said, hundreds. You may think of five or 10. I always do the test and ask my colleagues, how many do you think there are uh, possible funding opportunities for postdoctoral fellows? They'll say 15, meaning five, and there's indeed hundreds. So this database is completely available to you free of charge, and you'll see um, Criteria of eligibility, many do not entail citizenship, as I said, um, deadlines, amounts, and all the rest of it. So uh, take advantage of this resource because, as I said, it's free access to anyone. If you are um, also about to embark on a uh, tenure track position or you're at the end of a postdoc with a second uh, relevant a database of information, which are funding opportunities for early career um, faculty and postdoctoral fellows. Um, again, a massive database, utterly searchable with the information you want. How many pages? When's the deadline? What's the amount? Eligibility criteria. And you'll see many more than you may think are relevant for your research and the kind of work that you may have. So what about industry? Well. Um, I didn't get into, I won't have the time to get into this, but many of my recommendations are really very directly relevant. Uh, the people in the industry are going to recruit you are total intellectual snobs themselves. They come from these great programs you are part of, and we look at your CV almost similarly the way they look at a CV if you're looking for an academic position. Where have you published? How many papers you've published? Have you gotten fellowship? Have you done services? So my recommendations are really, really similar to what you'd have if you're looking for an academic position instead. Maybe you can skip the writing a postdoc application or early career grant proposal, uh, but all the rest of it is mostly very relevant. To illustrate this, I'm going to give two examples and really um, embarrass both Professor Alison Chambis, who was a PhD student with me, I don't know if she's on the call here, and Jerry Lee, who uh, Andrea just uh, mentioned. Um, Alison did a PhD with me, stayed on at Hopkins, did a clinical chemistry fellowship, and used this today to land her uh, uh, a track position in the Department of Pathology at USC, uh, and today overseeing uh, COVID testing for millions of people in Los Angeles, right? Unbelievable story because it's a freaking PhD. She's not an actual MD, but I think it takes an engineer to run this smoothly and to put this at scale. I think Andrea won't, di won't dispute this. Jerry Lee, completely different and tortuous path as well. Uh, after graduating from a PhD, no postdoc, by the way, for any of those, only a very short postdoc for Alison, Jerry Lee 
Jerry started his career at the National Cancer Institute and in no time quickly became the boss of 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 the, boss, uh, of the person who hired him in the first place. And in a matter of just a few years, became the number three at NCI and launched a bunch of initiatives because he didn't want to sit on his laurels, moved on recently to USC to uh, uh, the Ellison Institute, uh, and have continued to be incredibly successful. So there's different paths to success, and it's not cookie cutter, and many of those now have made themselves available for conversations with alums in the group. And uh, that's the contract, if you will, I always kind of uh, make them sign, it's a figure of speech, uh, that they have to open the door for the next uh, students coming out of the group. So I'm going to stop here. I hope I didn't go over time. One last thought. Think of applying of a green card. University can be a sponsor. I've sponsored many green cards at Hopkins and outside of Hopkins. Uh, if you work in a hot area, the odds of getting this may be, if anything, better than landing a J on H visa. Um, I won't elaborate, but it's food for thought for sure. So uh, if you have more questions, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm of service really to the larger community beyond Hopkins. There's many more resources beyond those I mentioned earlier at research.jhu.edu. Take advantage of them again. They're completely open to the public and there are many more uh, uh, resources you can take advantage of that you may think. I'm going to stop here and entertain questions. Um, so first, I want to thank you so much for this fabulous talk. Um, and obviously, you put a lot of, of energy and effort into it. Um, I'm sure, like, I, I think I learned a lot. Um, so I really appreciate it. Um, and um, we, we actually are out of time for questions. I went through um, a, a lot of the questions that have already come in, and you you actually answered them in the process of giving your presentation. So it's, it's actually wonderful. Um, and, uh, and and I know you need to get back to VPRing. Um, so That's I'm... right. Uh, uh, Andrea, one little note, and then I'll be on my way. Um, yep, yep. We both on Twitter, we're quite active on Twitter. Please uh, follow uh, Andrea, she's an unbelievable resource. <laughs> uh, looking out also to the community, I, I try to do my part as well. We disagreed on the role of dissertations. You may not remember on a thesis. I said, take papers, staple them, you're on your way. I've yeah. softened my uh, stand on this because I've learned, right? See? Mm -hmm. And thanks to you, credit to you, where there is value in the dissertation. There's a moment you have to write, for instance, a review of the literature. I just said, yeah. use this as a way to um, maybe write a review article. You see, I learned from yeah. the best and I uh, <laughs> wanted to uh, acknowledge um, your contribution to my change of mind on this. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, have, I guess it's, you're heading into afternoon, have a good afternoon. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm excited about what the next couple of days are going to bring. So, so, so am I. <laughs> okay. <laughs> have a good day.